Securities offered through Cetera Advisor Networks, LLC, member FINRA SIPC. Investment advisory services offered through CWM, LLC, an SEC-registered investment advisor. Cetera Advisor Networks, LLC, is under separate ownership from any other named entity. Carson Partners, a division of CWM, LLC, is a nationwide partnership of advisors. This is The Way to Wealth. With host Scott Ford, a jiu-jitsu fighting, woodworking, beekeeping entrepreneur who is also the managing director, partner, and wealth advisor of Carson Wealth. Financial freedom is the goal, and clarity and simplicity is how we'll get there. Let's get to it. This is Way to Wealth. Hello, and welcome back to the Way to Wealth podcast, where we're all about making money simple so you can focus on living fully and living fully now, not 30 years from today. Very excited to have Yannick Silver on the podcast. I met Yannick actually years ago. We had a had a conversation and then reconnected with some mutual friends recently and have a lot more in common. He's been called Cosmic Catalyst, the Maverick Mischief Maker, and a Galactic Goofball, which I love. He redefines how business is played in the 21st century at the intersection of more profits, more fun, more impact, creator of the Cosmic Journal. We were just talking about that. I loved your journal author of Evolved Enterprise and the co-founder of Maverick 1000, global network of top entrepreneurs, visionary entrepreneurs, making a serious difference in the world without taking themselves too seriously, which I had to get to that point in your bio because I love that point. Uh, but would love to just start with you, Yannick, sharing you know, a little bit of your backstory and then what brings you to where you are today and you know why we're talking today. So. Yeah. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, definitely uh, working on some good, serious uh, issues in the world and, and helping hopefully put a dent in those and not taking ourselves too seriously as I have a little puppet over my shoulder. <laughs> uh, it's, I think, uh, I think my story has got to start with uh, my family coming over from Russia, uh, 1976. I was three years old and, and my dad, it was me, my mom, my dad, and my grandmother. And my dad had he always corrects me. I, I get the number wrong, but it's something like two hundred fifty-six dollars in his pocket, or you mm. know, in, in that neighborhood, and and you know, not much use of the English language, and that, and that whole just immigrant success mentality of doing whatever it takes, and and you know, he came with with the skill, and so my mom, but very quickly he realized that uh, working for someone else was not the way to go, and he was about to get fired because he was moonlighting on the side doing repair work for other doctors. He was a biomedical technician. And so he took the path that that so many of us have taken, the, the sort of the the path maybe least taken, but leads to the most uh, interesting opportunities and adventures. And and he started his own medical equipment at that point, service only, and then became sales and service company. Uh, and out of our little apartment that we we're in, and then and then continued to grow it uh, into an extension in our house, and, and then you know having his own suite, and then took over other suites, and so. I got to witness that journey firsthand growing up in an entrepreneurial family and, and not just witness it, but in a family business, you, uh, you were asked to pretty much partake in it. And mm. so at 14 years old, I telemarketed for my own clients selling latex gloves um, and just straight out of the, I guess, probably yellow pages to Dennis. So I was, I was, he would drive me to work as a 14 year old. I'm, I'm sure there's probably some laws that were broken in that, in that part. <laughs> Uh, and he's like, and then at 16, the deal was I got a car, but only if I went out and cold called doctors. And, and so he's like, yeah, Mr. Young, then go, go, go make some sales. And literally, uh, you know, I'm this 16 year old kid, 17 year old, like talking to 50 year old doctors and, and trying to get them, you know, convinced that they should be buying medical equipment from us. And, and that was, it, it was a really unique opportunity to get a huge head start. I didn't think of it as a huge head start, right? Like my friends are like living at the beach and I'm like, I, I want to be living at the beach. He's like, no. <laughs> and, and so I, I do remember one time I did get pissed off at him and, and I ended up quitting and I worked at like called TCBY, which was a yogurt, you know, store the country's best yogurt. And I had the night shift. So I was breaking down the yogurt equipment. I'm like, this freaking sucks. Um, <laughs> I went back to him. And, and so, so, but I got this really great education super early, including uh, one of the doctors who I became friends with and sold him his entire surgery center. He um, it was my biggest sale at the time. And I was probably 17 and he gave me a Jay Abraham tape. And, mm. and uh, I don't know how many people know Jay Abraham, 
on this, but he's an incredible business strategist. And, and so I, I just listened to this thing over and over again. I'm like, oh, there's another way of doing this and just cold calling. And I really got ingrained in this idea of you know, key partnerships or direct response marketing and, and other ways of doing things. And, and it really changed things. And then I just got hooked. So I would listen to tapes nonstop. And my friends would be in the car with me. They're like, what, what is this stuff? And I'm like, don't worry, you're, you're not going to like this. You know, all my hockey buddies are in there and we're driving to games and practices. I'm like, oh, don't, don't worry. And listening to like Earl Nightingale and, um, and, and Brian Tracy and, you know, you name it, but then it also turned into marketing stuff like Dan Kennedy and, and Ted Nicholas and, and, and Joe Sugarman and just anyone that I could just get my hands on. And then I learned from Earl Nightingale that if you want to become uh, an expert in any subject, you study or, or uh, read about it for one hour a day for three years or world-class expert for one hour a day for five years. And I'm like, what happens if I do it just for like two hours a day or three hours a day? And I just got immersed in this idea that it was so fascinating that I could write a letter or an ad and have people take action. And it just changed our, the, the company from like a small regional player to a national player. Um, and my dad would look at these ads that were these long form ads um, trying to sell a fetal Doppler or selling an EKG machine or, or an exam table or something like that, that, you know, usually were only sold face to face. And he's like, who's going to read all this? And I'm like, oh, let's just try it. And, and they worked. And, and so that's where I got my, my marketing bug. And then, you know, just fast forward, that turned into me um, stepping into the internet space in, in about 2000. I just saw that there's something there and I wanted to do it. So I left my dad's business and that was a hard decision. Uh, and, and then I started my own little thing at three o'clock in the morning, got this idea for something called instant sales letters. And then that took off. And then people are like, Oh, how'd you do that? Could you teach me? Which turned into me teaching them, selling them, uh, how to, how to take their own information and knowledge. And I love that. And then about 14 years ago, I was just, you know, outside in everything looked great, making a lot of money, having great reputation in that space, which isn't that easy. And I just asked a really simple question, which is, am I happy? Would I be happy doing what I'm doing 10 years from now? And that was really the key to this next journey. And it was probably the hardest point because up to then, everything was like super easy. All my projects worked. It was just, you know, my friends were like, oh, you have the golden touch and it's just so easy. And then this part where it's like, I really felt like there's something more and, and connecting your head and your heart and your higher purpose, um, it, it started going sideways and it forced me to go back to even deeper like spiritual practices and bring that into, into work and entrepreneurship. And, and so it's been the greatest journey, but it was de definitely been a rockier one after that. Uh, but, but I think incredible meaning. And, and I think I have even more to share for entrepreneurs around that part of, of that impact piece. Mm, yeah. It's amazing. I love hearing stories of how people start and kind of get where we're at, you know, and I, I can relate my dad had me, my dad was actually a, a minister. And so uh, but never took a salary, so always worked. And so I was uh, always working. He never let me idle at all, which yeah. you know at the time I hated. So I can remember in seventh grade, roofing a whole edition on dad's church by myself. <laughs> he dropped me off and I roofed it, which of course I'm you know not happy about, but you did it. And now you're like, you look back and it's like some of the best things that could have happened to me, right? It talked work, work ethic. Yeah. I was on my own, so I had to figure stuff out. So it's like, yeah, it's amazing um, mm -hmm. how, uh, you know, things happen for you instead of to you when you really can zoom out far. I didn't think about that then, but ultimately it's really happened for you and to you when you can zoom far enough back to really get a, a, a clear picture of it. A hundred percent. And uh, you know, I know, so Will Smith, I just recently listened to his audio autobiography and obviously he's got a bit of a black eye here with what's going on lately, but you know, I, I really appreciated his story. And he starts his story talking about his dad. He was, a uh, he, he, uh, sold ice. Uh, and so he was an entrepreneur, but his, him and his brother had to build this gigantic wall. And, and they're like, and every single day they had to make progress on this wall. And, and it's like, it just it made him who he was. Um, and he hated it and hated it and yes. hated it. And there's this interesting, you know, you know, we can go in so many directions with it, but I have kids and, and there's like this interesting sort of um, balancing act between making sure that, you know, especially as entrepreneurs that we, we thrived on, on how to go from zero to something, how to create something. And, you know, there's adversity involved in that. So it's like, mm -hmm. you want to provide that for your children as well, but not create a way that they feel so resentful that, that it's going to, uh, 
just you know, break apart that relationship. And you also want them to have a better opportunity than you had, but not create entitlements. And it's such a, you know, that that's just one of the things that I constantly think about with my kids as well. I'm with it. I mean, a hundred percent, Yannick. And you were talking about all these names. I, I know every one of them. In fact, I just ordered uh, an updated version of Mr. Robbins rapid planning method. Right. So I, I think back, I was like, 19 listening to this stuff uh in really tony robbins all of them and he was my main guy back in the cassette tape days yep. and then when kids were young i asked my daughter a couple of days ago because I, I felt on this very subject and topic of you know how do you help your kids and not create entitlement you know and so i mentioned i was thinking this year feeling recently how cool it would be to maybe have uh, my kids involved in one of these events, like, Hey, would you want to go to yeah. either unleash the power within or the whole, um, his bigger one date with destiny and spend, you know, four or five, six days and laying out the future. Cause it, it's how it was helpful for me. And, you know, that was the whole purpose of starting legato. So who got this right is our friend, Rich Christensen, who I know, you know, he did it and he just raised five amazing children. And so mm -hmm. I was honored to be considered to be a part of the company Legato. I bring the structure piece to it. He brings the content of how do you raise, you know, kids without creating entitlement. And, you know, one of the key pieces there is rites of passage. So to me, that's taking indigenous wisdom that's been around for years and years that we lost and bringing it up to, mo to modern day times and science to use today. And I think you're onto something there. And I'm, I know it's tricky because yeah. I think if we just dump assets, which has been what's happened the last hundred years or so versus the values of how you got the assets, that doesn't end well. And we're actually robbing the juice of the, of what we went through with that grind and what we thought sucked at the time actually turned out to be some of the biggest benefits. So it is a, it is a bit of a tightrope to walk, isn't it? Yeah. And I'll tell you a story, you know, as an entrepreneur, we're always like, well, here's a, let me, let me scratch my own itch kind of thing. And, and that's how I ended up starting Maverick after that, that question. But one of the things that we did with Maverick for seven years, uh, and this is how Rich and I met, was we put on a, a family freedom event. Um, and so my kids were younger, they're now 16 and 14. And I'm like, you know, well, I, I could teach them about entrepreneurship, but whatever dad says is, is going to go out one ear, you know, through the other, whatever that saying is. And, and it's not as interesting, but if I made it fun and exciting, like we do for these other events and experiences we put on. And so that's what we did. We made an event for kids, uh, to, to actually immerse them in entrepreneurship and, and Rich and I are talking about this and I'd love to bring it back out and, and do more with it. Uh, because, we, we gave the kids, so it'd be around the holiday, like July 4th or, uh, or New Year's. I think we did, did we do a new, no, we did July 4th and I don't know. It might've been New Year's, but anyway, something that was a holiday and, and rallying the kids. And then we bought products and then I divided the kids up into teams and they could pick their products. And, and then they also knew their cost of goods. They had to pay back Mr. Yannick for the cost of goods. You know, it's not, it's not free. Um, and then they also had an opportunity we immersed them in a, in a nonprofit that we chose. So they got to actually participate in something, hang out, learn about the nonprofit's mission um, and, and play with, in this case, it was like special needs kids and teaching them about baseball and play a baseball game with them. And so they had an opportunity. They had to create their pricing. They had to create, if they wanted to bundle stuff up together, if they wanted to include the charity and what they were selling, they didn't have to, everything's optional. You know, it's all up mm -hmm. to them. They had to figure out their own plan. And then we had conversations for parents. We had conversations with parents and kids. We had conversations just with the kids, teaching about business. I usually used to say that was my hardest audience I would ever talk to because they were, <laughs> you know, all over the place. And you had to bring them back and, and trying to get them to understand, you know, value creation as an entrepreneur, what that equals, you know, how you how you're going to make money and 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 really figuring this part out. But then that we'd send them off on the streets, and you know, adults are they're not like if some kid comes up to you. You would think that they're going to be like, oh, it's a kid. It's, it's really cute. But, you know, not always. And, and they're going to get their nose and nose. And then when they get their yes, though, that, that, that's like it, it lights them up. And I saw this firsthand with my kids, um, you know, my son, who's a little a little shy or not, you know, massively shy. But but he he would just as soon as he got that, yes, he would just go out and, and he would just keep doing it. He loved it. And then especially when he added a charity element like it was, um, he was like, Hey, we, we did one in Annapolis and it was about uh, the Chesapeake Bay. 
And he's like, you know, buy a glow ball, save, save the Bay or something like that. And, and it's just like, he, he loved it. And it really turned on this idea, but they got to fully immerse it. And, and, and so it's, it's just like, if, if you want to do that, like, why not build something that's beyond just teaching them, you know, just one-on-one, but maybe make it something cool. And then they got to meet other kids that had other weirdo parents that were entrepreneurs and, and they could all relate together. And, and so it's just quite a fun experience. And then we, we truly let them experience it. Like there's one point where the kids set up, one team set up in a farmer's market and the other vendors called the cops on them. <laughs> and, <laughs> and we told, we told the parents always, you know, you can hang out with them, but let them handle everything. Yeah. And literally the cops came over and the kids talked to them and, and, and they're like, okay, well, you know, you can't be here. Uh, they're like, okay. And like, it, it was, it was amazing. That's, that's cool. Like that's the experience, right? And that's something for me, I'm called to, and I know another connection to Rich and now clearly you as well, is just teaching kids and middle school and high school kids that there is a track and path called entrepreneurism, right? And, and being a business owner or an entrepreneur, that's a path, not for everyone, but yeah. for some, and certainly was my path. And it's been great to me, but if I would have, you know, tried to do something more traditional, you know, I'm, I'm unemployable. It would never work. So yeah, giving them a understanding that, Hey, it's okay. You can take this path if you feel called to it and it's in your DNA to, uh, to walk that path. So I love that you're doing that. I think it's, it's spot on. You, uh, I know, talk about, I call it the three H's, head, heart, and um, higher purpose. Yeah. Talk a little bit more about that or share some more about that, if you would, Yannick, what you're up to and what you mean by head, heart, and higher purpose. Sure. Um, you know, this. so I think it started, um, so when I asked that one question, would I be happy that 10 years from now doing what I'm doing, um, it really started, I'm a big journaler. So almost every night I'm going to, I'll journal, um, you know, for the last several years it's been daily and before that it was kind of sporadic but I think it's one of the incredible success foundational principles that you can bring to your life even as an experiment and, and you know we can talk about journaling a little bit later on but so in that journal I just you know said okay what would make me happy and and it was these three interconnected circles originally so originally it was you know Venn diagram which I didn't even know it was called the Venn diagram but so these three interconnected circles it was it was a dollar sign um a heart and a happy face. And, and at the intersection was what I had called the maverick entrepreneur. And we've since changed that dollar sign to represent a tree. So it represents growth. So growing yourself and growing your business, but then the heart is the impact. And, and then the happy face is just, you know, what brings you joy and so forth. And, and I think where that intersection is, 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 is a life well lived and that, you know, it's a nice little shorthand. Uh, we call that maverick DNA, but so the head is our business side. And so I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs who are on their, you know, second, third, fourth gig, whatever stint, whatever it is. Um, and, and so usually a lot of times we, we figure out something that makes us money. And, and then at some point is kind of like that same question that I had, um, which is, you know, is this really what, what I'm meant to be doing? And so we don't want to throw away the head, which is our business sense and our marketing side and, you know, all, all the parts that, that are maybe more logical or more uh, of that part. But then we incorporate our heart, which is what's the impact that we want to make in the world and what do we really care about? And that impact can come from, you know, maybe what's a, what's a wrong that we want to right in the world or something that we've personally experienced in some way. Or I've also seen it where it's like connected to their customer base. So what is the product that we're selling? What do our customers really you know, want to see in the world? Uh, and we can talk more about that too, because that created what's called the evolved enterprise. And then the higher purpose, this is where it gets really exciting. And this is not a you know, one minute sort of exercise, but it's really digging deep into like, okay, why, why am I here? And, mm. and that gets into you know, the spiritual nature of, of who we are and, and what we're doing here. And this is such a unique, incredible time in so many ways. And, and yes, it's chaotic and, and, and things are tumultuous and, and changing so fast right now, but, but this is, you know, you know, I'm going to go with my own sort of mythology. And I believe this is why, what we signed up for. We volunteered for, for this right time and, and to help this, this next coming shift and, and this higher shift in consciousness. And, and that's what I believe is really going to, I talk about changing the way business is played or 
or you know, getting out of uh, business as usual. And a higher consciousness is what's going to bring us there because then we can bring higher intention to what we're doing. And I really think business is the greatest lever for making a difference in the world because you look at all the, so A, it's a, you know, the only way that you can succeed in business is, you know, unless you have some sort of, uh, I don't know, like, like monopoly that's, that's uh, state provided for you or, or something like that, which, which is eventually going to crumble. But the only way to really be in business is to provide value. And, and so I, I remember my very first journal I wrote, I get rich by enriching others 10 X to hundred X in return. Uh, and, and that's been a core value of what I continue th- kind of leaning into. And I think that's an easy shortcut for, you know, how do you, how do you show up in the world? And, mm-hmm. and so this head, heart, higher purpose is all, also part of this framework of this evolved enterprise as well. Mm, I love that Yannick. Um, it, one of the reasons I want to have you on. So, you know, for me, I talk about helping a thousand business owners build to exit and, you know, building to exit just means you're creating a company or enterprise that, um, you know, you play your part, but if you're building to exit, that's the only part you're play. You're not wearing all these different hats. And so you're able to bring to build a more valuable enterprise, but you're also able to live, life and grace along the way and actually a full life along the way versus someday, one day. And then most of these thousand business owners are at a stage where 10 to 25 years in business, they've done well, and it's now what? And so what is now what? Well, you mentioned business being the greatest lever. And I think the now what typically becomes or the opportunity now becomes impact and legacy and doing things that can be for the greater good. So for me, two things that I'm focused on, what's my next? It's making the money clean. What's that mean? Well, making the money clean to me is number one, investing in things that are tied to your values. So that's why I'm so passionate about family values first, then your business values. Well, all of this requires time, space, and margin. Like to me, that's the biggest thing missing. And you were ta- talking about why I'm here. Well, you're, we're not going to answer that on this podcast, right? It takes time, space, some journaling, some thoughts, some prayers, some meditation, all these things to get really clear what's the same for your family values, for your company values. But, you know, I think it was Steve Jobs that talked about simple's hard. But once you get that, you can move freaking mountains and you can. And so like with that clarity, now all of a sudden circling it back to making the money clean, if you're clear on you and your family's values, you're clear then how that ties to your company, corporate enterprise values. Now, how you use your dollars can have impact based on your values, but no one hardly is doing it. You know, if people really knew what their dollars were invested in, how many really do, but they if they did, they'd be shocked at what's, what they're supporting, what their dollars versus what they value. So to me, it's part of my role in making the money clean. So it's like that for me, that is the what's next. I so that. I'd love for you to you know add to that. And I know one of the things you talk about is now what for a successful yeah. entrepreneur for that next stage. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll give ever, all the listeners a couple questions too. As you said, it's not a one minute thing, but I love questions because questions create are, are expanding answers. What's the second one, Scott? You said making money clean. What's the second one? Oh, thank you. Ma- uh, making the invisible visible. So for me, there's a lot to that one. The primary focus, there's two things that came to me there. One is healing for the indigenous. And by the way, we all are when you just trace it the whole way back. And then two, um, it's mental health. I think I, I, I am, I know there's real mental health um, epidemic in the world and specifically in this country. And what do they really want? They want to be seen. So that's part of making the invisible visible. So, you yeah, know, they're just that. self-medicating and, and it's not why the drugs, as it said, it's why the pain and they just want to be seen. So my yeah. big things are making the money clean and making the invisible visible. Yeah. Um, I-, I love that. And so, this idea of the now what is, is huge. And it's, um, and again, I think journaling is a big part of this process. And as you said, meditating, praying, um, silence is a big part of it, of like just bringing quiet to our, our, you know, we live in this world that Mm. we, we got these, these devices that we're tethered to. So, so, 
uh, typically we have, uh, you know, so many things coming at us that, that the, um, that, that, that intentionally creating space for simply being um, is at a premium. And, mm. and so even if like, for me, it, it comes to like daily practices and then how do we create rhythms of, of things that might be greater? So some people will take retreats that are multi-day retreats. Some people will, you know, for me, uh, I like to honor the natural cycles of the world. So the equinoxes, the, the solstices, that, that for me is typically I'm out in nature for those days. Uh, you know, those are blocked off of my calendar or there's something else that I'm doing. And, and you know, just falling mm. into this natural rhythm is huge. But like, I love questions. And so some of my favorite questions to help people uncover, you know, these head, heart, higher purpose, uh, connections and alignment. Uh, one of them is, uh, what would my 111 year old self tell me? Mm. And, and this came for me. So my, my original thing, as I said, was that dollar sign, happy face, heart, and it became Maverick business adventures. And because I like the, the acronym of MBA, I thought it was mm. kind of funny. Um, and, and so I'm like, okay, I just want to hang out with other entrepreneurs and, and awesome founders that I'm friends with and others that I want to meet. And we would go off and go do these cool adventures and do bun, you know, doing buggy racing or flying big jets or, you know, doing whatever. And we'd have business sessions in the middle of nowhere. Plus we'd have a charity element. And, and I'm like, that's awesome. First one I did, uh, we, we got 26 entrepreneurs. I ended up losing $40,000. Um, and I'm like, ah, you know, whatever, it's an investment, it's a whole new thing. And then at about $400,000 in, uh, so my other company, I totally bootstrapped and then this I bootstrapped as well, but I had a much bigger sort of, uh, checkbook to, to keep bootstrapping it. The other one I bootstrapped with $1,500 for my internet company. This one, uh, had a bigger paycheck or a big, bigger checkbook. And my wife, after $400,000, she's like, um, what are you doing? And I'm like, yeah, I, I don't know, but, and, but I wasn't willing and I had like, really fallen out of love with what I was doing before. And it, it was difficult too, because I, any conference or any event I went to or anywhere, even if I wasn't speaking or doing anything, someone would be like, Yannick, you know, dude, you, you changed my life. I sell guitar lessons online now. And, and I'm like, oh, that's amazing. And, and, you know, become financially free from it. Or I, you know, I had like a kid come visit me who was in college and, and uh, he was starting to sell some stuff about, how to move an engine from a Honda uh, Accord into a Honda Civic or something. They're very niche, random. And I sat with him and, and helped him at a coffee shop. He drove up six hours. And, and he, then he started making $100,000 a year from his dorm room. His mom thought he was dealing drugs. And, you know, so I, I love that. But at the same time, I'm like, that's not my greatest impact. And I started like cutting off stuff I was doing in that digital marketing space because it, it wasn't feeding me as much. Like it feels like if you're not doing the work you're meant to be doing, like your soul is dying a little bit every single day. And, and so I kept like cutting stuff off and, and it didn't make any sense, even economic sense. I'd be, you'd be shutting down projects that are making me like multiple six figures because I'm like, now nah, I want it to really be congruent here. With and, and it wasn't like I was out of integrity with what I was doing. It's just, it didn't feel like, like who I was. And so this thing is going sideways, which, which is very different for me. And, and I'm like, okay, so what do I need to do? And, and so I asked my 111 year old self, what do I need to know? And then using my left hand, which is my non-dominant hand, I answered it. And the answer was, this is where you and I connect. I think a lot is I said, light a thousand suns who each have the potential to light another thousand suns. Mm. So you know, when I, I look at you as like one of those sons, right? Where, because if you're fully lit and, and you and I haven't worked together, so I'm not saying that, that, that this is a result of it, but the thousand has been so interesting. So now it's like your mission is the thousand entrepreneurs to move to exit. And, and so that changed what we we're doing with Maverick and even changed the name to Maverick 1000 to represent this idea that one entrepreneur can help change an industry, a thousand can help change the world. How do we get them to a point where they're fully lit up and they're mm -hmm. able to create these ripples, even if it's for what's next for them, it doesn't even have to be their current thing. And, and so that was a huge change. And that's when we changed, you know, to just more, I don't know, I started leaning more into even like more, more my weirdness. And I think your weirdness is what makes things really, really great and interesting. And so I had always been into like sacred sites and, and all sorts of things as a kid and I kind of put it away. And then it really forced me to go back during this time almost to be like, okay, not, it wasn't rock bottom, but it was a very dark place because as an entrepreneur, our, 
our, our self-worth is so connected to, to our net worth and how are things are going in our business. And it, I had to remove that and try and recreate, okay, who am I? And, and start from zero and go back to those resources that I'd studied for 25 years and be like, okay, well, what makes a good day? What makes a good week? And who am I truly? And then other questions like, uh, this is one kind of crib from Brené Brown, which was, uh, what would I do even if I knew it would fail? And, and so I think she has a version of that. And I love that because it, it disconnects our, like as entrepreneurs, we're so connected to what's the outcome, what's the success of it, how, you know, what are the sales numbers, but what would I do even if I knew it would quote unquote fail? And, mm-hmm. and during this time, I also, you know, I love synchronicities too. Synchronicities start showing up about like nudging us towards this right path. And my wife is, uh, is really scared of bugs and so forth. And I remember one night, um, I play ice hockey still. And, and she like texted me or called me. She's like, ah, I got, I got something for you, uh, upstairs. And, and it was like, uh, she had like, I think trapped or smashed a spider maybe under this book. And, uh, and, and so I, I'm, I'm like, Oh, this is an interesting book. I haven't seen this in, in a long time. I haven't even read it. And it was called, uh, the great work of your life by a guy named Stephen Cope. Who's a, who's a yogi. Uh, and, and he studied the Bhagavad Gita and, but looked at other people's lives, like, um, like Nelson Mandela and Susan B. Anthony and Harriet Tubman. And then other people, like when they found their, their true Dharma, which is, which is, you know, roughly translated to like your, your true path and and so forth. And, And so, but one of the key tenets of the Bhagavad Gita is that we're, we're only entitled to our labor and not the fruits of our labor. And so that's that whole question of what would I do, even if I knew it would fail, Mm-hmm. And, and it just opened up this, this idea of like, okay, well, what, what you know, if, if, who cares what the outcome is and, and do things that are just bringing us joy and bliss and feel like we're fully utilized. And that, that's the big thing, like to feel like every part of ourselves are, are utilized. So like this idea of making money clean and making the invisible visible, um, you know, so then what, what we would do is, is be like, okay, well, how can that show up? Maybe it's your existing business. Maybe it's not, maybe, but but not throw away the business part. So a lot of entrepreneurs are like, okay, I made my money. Let's just go only into philanthropy. I think we lose something there. And that's why the Evolved Enterprise came together too about how do we bring uh, a, a key cause almost at the center of the company. It has to start with you. First, you have to evolve. And that's a never ending process of, yep. of continual exploration and so forth. And even like going into some of the parts that we might not want to look at, like the shadow aspects and, and, and the healing parts that we need to look at, because a lot of times we have these trauma responses that we we're building up a business to, for some reason to, you know, either to make our parents, you know, it, you know there's so many things that have, that, yes. that have shown up, but now it's like, you, you have to clean that part up so that you can be in full alignment. You don't have to if, if you want to. Um, and that's an evolving part. And then you have the next part around that is cause, like what, what do I really, really care about? And then you start building around that. And then that builds a community of customers that that are, are zealots and advocates for what you're doing. And, and there's a culture for that. And then it's baked into the product or service. And that's how, you know, Evolved Enterprise starts coming together. And, and then you start getting into your next greatest act and your, and your real great work there. Amazing. Yeah. I align with all that. Uh, Yannick and you know it, it we'll we'll talk about because there's so much synchronicity to what you were shown and called to and what I've been shown and called to. There's no accident there as far as because yeah. I had the same feeling and 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 vision of a, why a thousand business owners. Why is that number? Well, because with a thousand that are building to exit, where they're really now uh, making the money clean and they're at a stage. Uh, in their lives that they can focus on legacy and impact uh, focused on, you know, their make their version of making the money clean. What impact does that have on the planet? It's big. Like it's like that. So that's why yeah. a thousand and yeah, I know accident there. So we'll have to talk about. Uh, well, so here, like, check this out, Scott, like, uh, and, and you have this, and I literally just flipped to this quote unquote by accident, but I wasn't, uh, this is the page I was actually looking for. And it says catalyze the cosmos. And it says, light a thousand suns, you can light a thousand more suns. And then there's a quote here from Bhagavad Gita. It says, if a thousand suns were to rise in the heavens at the same time, the blaze of their light would resemble the splendor of that supreme spirit. And that's from a chapter called Cosmic Vision. And so I didn't even know about the Gita before that came to me. And, and then I, I saw this quote in this chapter. I'm like, wow. And this is many years later. 
Um, and then after that, I wrote A Sun Nourishes Life Everywhere, and together, A Thousand Suns is a cosmic mosaic enveloping the universe and beyond. If they also light a thousand suns, there's a, a million lights of splendor ablaze. The radiance and illumination would alight all the cracks and crevices where darkness lingers still. So yeah. it's, you know, again, and, and, and these things like build on each other and I've like continue finding these interesting synchronicities and new nuances and things like that. Um, mm. Where even like the other night, us studying about like Aleph, which is the uh, the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet, and and Aleph represents one. Um, and so there's interesting aspect of, of the Hebrew alphabet where every number, every letter represents a number, and and then uh, but it also represents a thousand. And I'm like, oh. That's so fascinating. And it just like, you know, it, it just shows up um, in, in this really, really powerful way. It's amazing. I call it flow uh, and have now for quite some time. It's been my thing, flow, not force. And it's like, that's the idea of the infinite entrepreneur is, you know, we've all done it where we're too hot or too cold or we're forcing and, and all these things. And you can do it literally in flow. And like, that's my, that's, that's the next for me. I am doing it. I know I can feel it. And then in yeah. that state of flow, all these things show up and it's like on a daily basis, it's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I just saw that. I can't believe that person just said this. <laughs> and it's all just, you know, showing up in perfect flow and oh, harmony. Right. I'll show you um, a, a great picture uh, that you might like for as an infinite entrepreneur. So I don't know how well you can see this. Oh uh, Yeah. So this is like a little doodle about the infinite now. And so the infinity point is also representing the past and the present and representing to me, you know, cosmic consciousness or um, source consciousness coming down to earth as well. And, and so you have this like interesting intersection point and, and so there's, there's I so love that. that. I love yeah. that. In fact, we'll have to do a follow up here uh, <laughs> after the podcast because I have so much uh, happening now with the Infinite Entrepreneur, and you're right on the same point with it. And you were talking about the. So I mentioned making the money clean, right? Making the money clean and making the invisible visible. They're my two big things of my next. And then when, when I think I'm making the money clean, you had mentioned what would you do even if you failed? Yeah. And I think that's so applicable to making the money clean. Let me give you an example. Right yeah. now, there's all kinds of volatility and turmoil going on, including in the markets, right? Mm -hmm. And so if someone's just invested in something and all they're doing is watching the volatility and the turmoil in the markets, what's that going to do? It's going to create fear and they're going to feel incongruent and they're going to be scared, right? If, however, you knew your family values, you knew your company values, and you knew you were invested in a way that was supporting those values, no matter what, you're supporting, your dollars are supporting who you are and what you're here to do. And you yeah. knew that. How does it? How does the volatility fare and feel now? Oh, I, I mean, I'm in it for the long haul then. It doesn't matter to me. That, that yeah. right? So it changes everything because totally the money's clean. Right. You're aligned. Yeah. No, a hundred percent. And, and we have more power than we believe. Um, I just recently changed my, my, my wealth advisor, uh, because of that whole, I'm like, wow, I've been like very, I'm like conscious in certain parts of my life and it's completely unconscious here. Um, and, and then I just wanted to take more sovereignty and control of, uh, of that. And, and it, you know, it, it, it has, it's just like a very, like all of a sudden, you know, my, my wealth advisor and I, I, I you know, I liked them. I had them for a long time and, and they were doing fine, but there wasn't that element of, of intentionality. And, and I think that's huge. It's like, how do we bring more intentionality to it? And, it, you know, this is also everyday purchases and, and we can truly vote with our dollars Totally. and, and customers are doing this already. So co companies um, like the, the trends, and this is what I talk about for Evolved Enterprise is that if there's a seismic shift going on and the shift is customers want to buy from companies that have a greater purpose and meaning and mission. And, they, and it can't be fake, right? It can't be because you see these trends happening. It's like, oh, I, I should add, you know, this thing. And, and it's, we have so much more transparency now and more and more every day, month and so forth that eventually things come out. So, so things, if it's, if it's done, you know, disingenuously, it's going to come out, but if it's done with, uh, with true integrity and purpose or as much as you can, because there's always going to be ways of making it better. Uh, and, and so adding that element, but then also inside out, which is your, your team members want to work 
uh, with and for a company that, that is making a greater difference in the world. So that's how you're going to recruit the best people in the world uh, to yes. be a part of, of what you're doing. Yeah. So it's really coming together right now. And it's, it's, it's exciting. And I think of it as like, you know, there's all these different words for it, conscious capitalism, uh, triple bottom line, social enterprise, uh, evolved enterprise is what I call it. And, but it doesn't really matter. Like, I think this is going to become um, just uh, table stakes for the game uh, because, uh, you know, just companies that they, they, if without a competitive impact or not a competitive impact, without a key impact component there, you're going to be at competitive disadvantage. Yes. Yeah, perfect, 100%. I like to talk about, too, just the laws of nature and, like, getting back to natural law where things are – nature is reciprocal, mm-hmm. right? It, 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 gets the, it gets the need for the whole. It's not just extra, – it's never just extracting. It's always reciprocal. And so, oh. you know, we breathe in oxygen that plants put out, and we create carbon dioxide, and we breathe that out, and that gives to the plants, and it's a reciprocal relationship – that's part of making the money. That, that's your infinite loop as well. That's it, man. 100%. That's it. That's and, it. And if, um, you know, more and more entrepreneurs can lean into that because entrepreneurs are the change makers that you said. Yes. And, it, um, and we have more leverage than we even believe. So I, I think of it as there's five big levers that we have as entrepreneurs. Um, and, and so A, it's money, capital, whatever, currency. That's one, but that's not even one of the five. Like, so there's, there's empowered employment. Like who are you bringing on to, to work with you? And, and is there ways of maybe giving second chances to somebody, uh, maybe formerly incarcerated citizens, maybe uh, people who might be mm. looked at as having a, a disadvantage already? Like, so for instance, there's a company I highlight in the book that, that does uh, quality control tests in between different browser platforms and, 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 and uh, different like operating interfaces. And so it's like, they hire people on the neurodiversity scale, like, because they typically have more attention to detail and, and are okay with repetitive tasks. And that creates a competitive advantage for, for their company. So, you know, thinking about it that way, uh, I know a company mm. that hires people transitioning out of hom- homelessness to create some of the jewelry that they're doing in it. It becomes a better story as well. So it's, it, you know, but again, it can't be done out of just a marketing thing, but, it, yep. but it's all together and it's, it's just great. And, and so that's one is empowered employment. Another is like your supply chain. Who are you buying from? Like then again, intentionally thinking about, okay, where, where, who are we buying from and what are their values? What are, yes. what are they uh, representing? Um, we have our actual product or service itself. How do we bake in impact into it? Um, a lot of people, when they start thinking about this, they're like, oh, okay, we'll do a buy one, give one. You know, I've seen like, let's say Tom Shoes is a big company that is really blown up because of this whole idea of buy a pair of shoes, give a way a pair of shoes to a, a kid in need somewhere. And I know Blake, who's the founder of it, and and he would be the first to tell you that they ne- he never expected it to be the, that big. And because they got that big, it became a logistical issue. And it was it, it was just uh, you know a bigger thing that, that showed up, that these unintentional consequences. But the, the intention of it was really good. But it, it, there were some things that happened, like they were taking away marketplace from you know, local shoemakers and so forth. So it was an interesting example, but a lot of people are like, oh, we'll just do a buy one, give one. But that might not be the right model for, sometimes it is like this sock company called Bumba Socks. And, and they created a, a sock that they give away to homeless shelters. And, and they thought they'd sell maybe a million pairs of socks in 10 years if they're lucky because they do the buy a pair of socks, give away a pair of socks to a homeless shelter. And they, but they designed a better sock. It was like a dark colored one. It was reinforced stitching. It was anti- microbacterial. So it was like really great product for that giveaway. And they got to a million pairs in like two and a half years. And, mm. and so this kind of stuff accelerates it. So you can think about your product or service and incorporating the impact, but it doesn't have to be buy one, give one. So, you know, one of the things I talk about in involved enterprises, there's so many other ways of doing it too. So it could be like focusing in on where's the, the source of the material. So that goes back a little bit to our supply chain, but there's a company that designs amazing stuff out of old fire hose. Uh, they're called Elvis and Cress. And they, you know, instead of that going into the landfill, they're like, okay, we're going to design these amazing belts and wallets and, um, and dop kits. And I own a wallet and a, and a belt from them. And 50% of their profits goes back to, to firemen and women charities. So it's like, it's beautiful full circle as well. Mm. There's so many ways of doing it. So product or service, empowered employment, supply chain, also your distribution. So think about like what kind of voice do you have? 
uh, whether it's your, your database, whether it's even like the packages that you're sending out, that, can that in, include an insert for something that you care about? Can that be, you know, another way of, of getting your distribution, like using that in some way? I saw a company that was a, um, a plant-based meat company and on the outside of their packaging, it was like, you know, call your senator about climate change or something like that. So, you know, regardless of what you believe in in that part, but they, that's their value. They, they believe in it. Yep. And so let's use every aspect of what we have. So that's their distribution. The other one is talent or um, just the unique ideas within your organization and company. So there's a, there's a company uh, I love called Pacific that does something really interesting. They're a soup manufacturer or, or non-perishable goods manufacturer. And every month they shut down their production line and they work with the local food bank and take in all this food. They don't know what the ingredients are they're, they're going to get, but, it, but the creativity of their team has to come up with unique recipes for whatever is there. And then they come up with non-perishable goods for that, that food bank. And they've saved like hundreds of thousands of pounds of food every single year because of that. So like, what's the unique talent that your organization has? So there's so many ways of leveraging and creating impact, which then, you know, your team gets so excited by it. And it's like, there's, there's something dramatically incredible that happens in that way. Yeah, no, it's beautiful, man. That's well said. That's exa- all examples of making the money clean. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we, we do vote with our dollars from where you shop at the grocery store. Or do you support the local farmer's market or are you get you know, buying local or are you, you know, if you're into like we are permaculture. And so, you know, we don't spray any herbicides, pesticides, fungicides, whatever on the property. Well, you know, if I'm then investing in XYZ company that that's what they do. It's like, what am I doing? Right. So yeah. absolutely, and, and, man. And you don't even know, maybe like inadvertently that's you might it. Be supporting these companies. That's it. Through. And when you look, and this is the key for me, when I think of these thousand business owners building exit, I look at the money that they have of what they're doing in the business and then what they're allocating in their investment portfolio. There's big numbers. And those big numbers can be invested in these companies that go against right. the very core of who they are. So it's like to me, let's clean that up. Let's yeah. make sure we get back in control and we get congruent with yeah, and what we're you know, maybe some of their portfolio goes to incubating ideas and companies or helping young entrepreneurs start things that are hundred percent. So there's so many ways of really leaning into what what do we want to do in the world? And and so like the whole making the invisible visible, you know, that there could be ways that you incubate projects and ideas that that are for mental health and and yes and it doesn't only have to be nonprofit. like i said like i think that the future is like these these unique partnerships that happen between nonprofit partners and and businesses and allow entrepreneurs to do what we're, we do best and but do it in a way that's full-hearted and, and using our head and feel like we're you know truly giving our all couldn't agree more man because then that's how it can be sustainable and regenerative because if it's just say just, but if it's a nonprofit and they're always just looking for money to be, I got to give to me to keep right. it going, that's not sustainable because no one's got enough money to keep doing that. Let's do it in a way where they can self-sustain. So yeah, uh, I'll give you a great example of that too. It's a company that I really liked. Uh, it's called Rebel, R-B-B-L. It's, mm. a, it's a beverage company. Um, and they were started from a nonprofit think tank or not a think tank created out of the nonprofit uh, called uh, Not For Sale. And they do... Um, some work in the Amazon trying to trying to alleviate sex trafficking, which which I didn't even know was you know a, a core piece there, and because of of these some impoverished areas where where there's there's not that much opportunity. And what they did is say, okay, here's we have what, what are our ingredients, right? Well, here's our resources that we had. They, they have you know some unique ingredients, in this case, food ingredients that they could bring to the table, and they had some people come in and think about like what could we create, and they created a beverage company a really, really great beverage company. And then it's spun off out of there. And, and so they will, they'll make all sorts of great beverages now. And I think that they're being run now by the, the former CEO of, of Cliff Bars. So, you know, it got a really, really big CEO once it started getting traction. And I think 1% of their profits or revenue, I don't, I don't remember which one, goes directly back to not for sale, the nonprofit. So mm. really nice reciprocal relationship, but also not for sale, helps um, create the supply chain uh, mechanisms for them inside the Amazon, which, which creates more opportunity for that region, which is all some of the core work that they're doing. It's exciting times. I yeah. mean, it really is. It's exciting time to be alive, to be able to work on and work with, get in flow, some of these things that we're here to help solve and make better. Yeah, exactly. 100%. Well, talk a little bit, if you would, 
uh, Yannick, about journaling. I know you have a journal. It's been big and uh, transformative to, to you. I journal. I love your journal. So I'd love to hear your thoughts uh, on journaling. Yeah, it's one of the things that I do love sharing with entrepreneurs because I think it is uh, just a transformative practice. And so many of us have maybe some sort of limiting belief or idea about it. But a lot of times you've heard about journaling and it's like, oh, I, I should do it. And, and you know, you feel guilty about not doing it in some way, or maybe you started it and, and stopped, or you feel like, gosh, you know, if I put in something that I don't want anyone to read, you know, do, do I really want to share that? Or, and that's going to be out there and whatever the case is. So there's so many reasons not to do it in that way, but you can also alleviate that by saying, okay, well, I can lock it up. I can, I can put it somewhere. I can use code words in there. I can do all sorts of things. I've only had one time when I've written a page and I've ripped it out and burned it because I really didn't want anyone reading it. But, but there is scientific proof that journaling makes you happier because it creates a beginning, a middle, and an end uh, to any kind of narrative. And a lot of times we have these ideas that, and thoughts that are constantly rolling around in our head and it allows us to process that. And, and journaling is really just for you. It, it can be done in so many different ways. Um, you know, sometimes if I'm feeling a little bit down, I might take an entire page and just write about bullet points of everything I'm grateful for. Um, mm. Sometimes it's, it's just like, whatever I start with is not what I finish with. I, it's just about getting started. Writing is a huge part of it. And if you write about, okay, here's what I had for lunch. It's not going to be very exciting, but if you're digging deeper into, you know, what, what's really going on in, in your inner world and, and how you feel, it's, it's really powerful in that way. And, um, and so I, I tell people, you know, think of it as an experiment, maybe do a 21 day or I like 33 days is a, you know, more than a month, a very specific number. And it's like, do that as a little experiment and see and give yourself, make it easy to win. So for me, um, it's typically the same place, uh, same time ish, but if you're just starting with journaling or you want to get back into it, like give yourself, like, it doesn't have to be a half hour thing or an hour thing, like make it a 10 minute block. And, and make it easy to, to just win and then pick a journal that you really, really like. Like when, that, when you pick it up, you're like, oh, this, this is worth my ideas and insights. And it feels like really nice. And, and the paper is really nice. And, um, you know, so, so think about what you want to do. And, and I love these, these like little colored pens. But if you look back at my old journals, they're all black and white. But then I started using colored pens and then my drawing and doodles started coming back in. And, and I, as a kid, I wanted to be a cartoonist. So like, that, that really brought me joy so that the, the drawings start coming back. But, you know, your journal has so much um, that you can do with it. And, and then you start making notes of synchronicities and you start making notes of, you know, interesting things that show up and then you can start going back to it. And, and I like also randomly flipping through it. I'm like, oh, well, let's, let's see what I need to know and, and flip through like, you know, five years back in a journal and see what was going on. And a lot of times like, oh shit, I was, I'm still thinking about that and, mm. and, and I either need to do something about it or, or I need to, you know, drop it because or you'll start seeing themes and, and you'll also be like, Oh, I was worried about this. And here's, and then you see what happened and you're like, okay, and it just gives you more confidence that, that things work out in the right way. Or, or it's, it's just, you know, just a really, really beautiful process. And especially as you're bringing more awareness to, to who you really, really are and, and what you're meant to be doing here. It's, it's a great, it's a great tool. And, you know, I, I would, if I had my great grandfather's journal, like it would be an amazing gift too. And, and so you're not doing it for somebody else, but because you do want to write it just for yourself. Uh, but, but again, there's, there's so many benefits to it. And then what I created was this cosmic journal that, that you have. And, and yes. that's stemmed from, you know, another kind of experiment. I love these experiments where it's just like, all right, well, I have no idea what it's going to turn into but I just wanted to do a piece of art. I had this challenge going around online, which was a hundred day art challenge. I'm like, Oh, that's, that's a lot of days. And what the heck would I even create for a hundred days? And, you know, I travel around a lot and, and I'm like, well, and, and in my journal, I wrote, well, what would be the byproducts and what would I, you know, how would I feel if I actually did do it and what would, and so it convinced me to, to do it. And without any, any just outcome that I had expected. And I, I, I did 108 days because in many of the wisdom traditions, that's a, that's a key number. And mm. so I took a little moleskin journal and put 108 check boxes and literally every single night could be one o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, whatever it was. I just had something I'd either meditate and something would come through me or I take past year's journals and pull something out. 
And it was such a fun, interesting process. And then I started showing like just magic started appearing and I showed it to one of my friends, a bunch of friends. And one of them was like, Oh, I'm going to publish this for you. And, and, and I'll pay to publish it. And I'm like, okay. And, and then I got a meeting with one of the biggest transform transformative uh, book publishers out there. Hey house. And they're like, they're like, ah, I, this is amazing. We've never seen anything like this. And so they, they booked the contract with me right away. And then also for a deck of Oracle cards and so now it's turned into, into this, which is the, the Cosmic Journal. And it's been such a cool tool for, for anyone. And they flip it, it could work like an Oracle. You flip it open, it has a message for you, and then it has space for you to, to write. Um, or you can go page by page and there's a real arc to it. So it's, it's been such a fun project. So it, it's a great way of getting into journaling or enhancing your journaling in some way as well. I love it, man. And I, I, so I would add uh, one thing just on, on the, you, you mentioned, the actual journal, you know, being something you like to look and feel. Same with the pen, something you like to look and feel. I have a pen I really like to write with. think that's important. Mm -hmm. And I do the same thing. I got colored uh, pens as well. Uh, fine point that I really like using when I'm, because I, I like color yeah. and so add to it. So couldn't agree, um, couldn't agree more. So, so much, man, uh, so much we could talk about. You've uh, certainly dropped and shared a ton of wisdom um, covered lots of ground and so much we could go. We could do this all day. Uh, yeah, that's it's, fun. Exciting stuff and exciting stuff to be a part of uh, and just kind of co-create, not kind of, but co-create and make our impact that we're here to here to make. What would you say? Any uh, final remarks, Yannick, or what would be the best way for people that's like, man, I really like and dig what this guy's talking about that they would find more about you? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Scott. I think uh, for entrepreneurs that are doing seven, eight or nine figures, uh, the collective group that we created called Maverick 1000 would, would be a spot to check out. We do some really interesting things. Like we just got back from Antarctica and a project came out of that where it's going to be uh, an algae based fish oil product because krill is overfished there. And so, you know, mm. using not only just our, our, our capital, but using our, our entrepreneurial brain power and resources. And we like piece together all the elements that we need to, to create this brand. So we love doing that. We also take trips to Necker Island, which is Richard Branson's private Island. We've been doing that for, 11 or 12 years, hoping to get you and some of your people there shortly. Uh, and, and that, you know, same thing. We have a key project that we work on there. And, and so if, if people want to check that out, maverick1000.com and, you know, the cosmic journal is one of my favorite things that, that is out there. And it's, it's just a, a fun, a fun project and that's available on Amazon or hayhouse.com. And then uh, evolved enterprise is definitely worth a, a read. Uh, wrote that a couple of years ago and, and that felt like it's maybe even a little bit ahead of its time. And now it's really coming into the, the right timing. Yeah. Couldn't agree more, man. And it was, I was thinking earlier, it was Tony Robbins. I think that said a life, life worth living is worth recording. And so journaling is a powerful thing and you have such a cool uh, journal that you put, to, put together. So we'll have to run this back again if you're open to it. Yeah, so uh, thanks for joining, man. Yeah. We'll uh, have you back on because I know you got plenty more to share. We could stay here, stay here all day. So with that, uh, thanks again, Yannick and audience. I'll catch you next week on the Way to Wealth podcast, where we're all about making money simple so you can fully live and do that now, not 30 years from now. Catch you next week. The opinions voiced in Way to Wealth with Scott Ford, Managing Director, Partner, and Wealth Advisor of Carson Wealth are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly. Investing involves risk, including possible loss of principal. No strategy assures success or protects against loss. To determine what may be appropriate for you, consult with your attorney, accountant, financial, or tax advisor prior to investing. Guests on Way to Wealth are not affiliated with CWM LLC or Satara Advisor Networks LLC. Legato Family is not affiliated with Satara Advisor Networks LLC or CWM LLC. Carson Wealth, 19833, Leitersburg Pike, Suite 1, Hagerstown, Maryland, 21742.